It was a beautiful day in May. The sun was shining, the sky was blue. Not that the family really noticed that. A mother, a father, 12-year-old twins, Pinchas and Sabina. Disheveled and weary, they stood in line at Maidanic death camp. The lines were split, men and women, then again, life, then death. Commotion. Sabina had been sent to life, her mother to death, and she struggled to get back to her mother, back to death. They let her go. Pincus watched the golden braid of his twin sister disappear around the low brick building. An hour later, he was the only one still alive. I looked into his eyes, eyes that have seen what no eye should ever have witnessed. They're not bitter, they're gentle, knowing a world within a world. She was my sister. She was my twin. But to live there, I, I had to wipe her out. My emotions had to die. And now, I cannot even remember her face. Stephen, I want you to help me find my sister. I realize that if Sabina is lost, then we all are lost. We need to find her for our conscience, otherwise any child can be turned to ash. Every child is under threat. You see, memory is not only a reflection about the past, it reflects on our present too. Jerusalem, 1991, my brother James and I were at the Holocaust Memorial there, Yad Vashem. We walked around the museum and saw the images, men, women, children, shot, gassed, burned. For some reason, I thought that the Holocaust was a Jewish issue. There that day, I discovered it's my issue too. You see, the Jews did not perpetrate the Holocaust, they were its victims. They carry the burden. This was the product of West European civilization. It's our problem. It's a human responsibility. We went back to England and created Britain's first Holocaust center, not as Jews saying, this happened to us, but as people saying, this must not happen to anyone. And then it did. 1994, Rwanda. Beata was running for her life through the courtyard. The only way out was through a dead tunnel at the end. She ran down this alleyway and banged on the gate at the end with just seconds to live. The killer was right behind her. Amazingly, the door opened. She fell through, it slammed shut and bolted back. And there, on the other side, an 11-year-old girl, Aisha. The killer found his way into the courtyard, so they ran into the house screaming, and the owner of the house, Yahya, came to the door. Get off my land, he said to the killer. He stood his ground, give me the girl. Yahya called the two girls from inside the house and stood in the doorway holding their hands and said, you kill my daughter Aisha before you kill this girl. Now leave or the wrath of Allah will be upon you for all time. I said to him, Yahya, what made you do that? He said, well, it says in the Quran that he who saves a single life, it's as if he saves the whole world. And he who destroys a single life, it's as if he destroys the whole world. He had absolutely no idea that virtually the same text exists in the Jewish tradition too. Beata, the girl he saved, went on to marry my brother. And so every time I see my lively, spunky, cheeky niece, Ariella Aisha, she is a physical reminder of the power of goodness and of action and of Yahya's conscience. Conscience. So where is my conscience? In my head, in my heart, in my bones? Did did I learn it at school or from my religion or 
sitting on my mother's knee. Who tells me what I should think or do? Well, I do. My conscience governs my, my thoughts and my actions, my sense of right and wrong, my respect of you and who you are. My conscience is a part of me, deep in me. Nineteen ninety three. Steven Spielberg is in Poland filming Schindler's List. On the set there are Holocaust survivors, historical advisors, if you like. Uh, tell us, um, where were the wagons exactly? Were the guards there? What was the atmosphere like? Where did you stand exactly? One day one of those survivors came up to him and said, Mr. Spielberg, I don't want to tell you just this part of my story. I want to tell you my whole story. And so Steven Spielberg followed his conscience and filmed 52,000 Holocaust witnesses in 56 countries in 32 languages and created the largest archive of audiovisual material on a single subject in the world. It's home, the USC Shoah Foundation Institute. But this is far more... This is far more than an archive, because it's so much greater than the sum of its parts. You see, this is the voice of conscience of our age. And now, as we add testimonies from Armenia and Cambodia and Darfur and Rwanda, we are adding to that voice of conscience as we unmute the voice, the scream of the human condition, just one voice at a time. You might think that this is an archive of despair, but as you listen, you hear the strength and the tenacity and the hard-fought hope. Just one voice at a time. We live in a world of violence, where it seems there is a lack of political will to prevent it, but in fact, what we need to focus on is social conscience, and I am the effector of that social change. I speak for me. I am the voice of conscience in our world, and so are you. So don't react. Act. Don't wait to be led. Lead. One person can make a difference. Small actions make big global change. Let me give you an example of that. We think of genocide as being extreme killing, but actually it's exclusion taken to its ultimate extreme. I exclude you because you are black. I exclude you because you are a Muslim. I exclude you because you pose a threat to me. I exclude you because I don't think you have a right to live here, and I exclude you because you have no right to live. The prevention of genocide is the prevention of exclusion, one person at a time. You see, the Nazis did not murder six million Jews. They murdered one, and then another, and then another, and another. So just imagine every single person in Europe, if they felt the pain of their neighbor, and had listened one voice at a time, and had acted one person at a time, the Holocaust would simply have been impossible. That revolution of conscience would have changed the history of the world. Not that we would have known that, because the Holocaust simply wouldn't have happened. For that revolution of conscience to have worked, it needed to have taken place long before the Nazis ever existed. So now, it seems, is the time for that revolution of conscience because your pain can be mine, and my voice can be yours. So here's my simple suggestion to change the world just a little bit. Why not go and listen to one other person whose experience is not your own? And as you hear their story, listen to your own story, and then listen again. Perhaps even take one of the Holocaust survivor testimonies and hear in their voice your voice. 
your heartbeat, your struggle, your strength, your hard-fought hope, and you will be hearing the voice of conscience. Not that they will tell you what to do, but you will know what to do and when to do it. Pincus and I journeyed through memory in search of Sabina's golden braid. I simply listened and I heard his gentle, torn, despairing, yet strong and inspiring soul as he searched through the fragments of memory in his tormented mind. We never found Sabina. Her smile, her laugh, her bright blue eyes, the only trace is her golden braid burned into the retina of his mind. But because we searched, she is not lost altogether. Because as we journeyed, I found pieces of her. And as I listened again, I found pieces of me. And as I put them back together, deep in my conscience, I find I am inspired to listen and to act, one voice at a time. Thank you.